Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good, good to see a nice, uh, robust turnout today for a couple of our faculty. Um, uh, every um, uh, we we try to uh, try to entice the faculty into presenting by doing these two firsts, uh, so they only have to present half the time. And so today we uh, are having um, uh, two presentations by our uh, faculty, Nicole Weisskopf and Paul Gorman. So I will be quick. <laughs> um, uh, Nicole is going to go first. And um, I think all of you know Nicole. She's an assistant professor in the department. Uh, she comes to us uh, by way of Columbia University. I, I won't do the Stanford thing like I did last week because that didn't go over too well. Um, anyways, uh, uh, she... Um, uh, was a very uh, successful PhD student at Columbia um, and uh, we were thrilled to recruit her to OHSU and um, she's going to talk about her uh, current project. Go ahead. Uh, For those of you and I'm sure there are people who are watching online, if you would like to ask a question, uh, send a tweet to um, at real OHSU, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, to hashtag DMICECONF, D-M-I-C-E-C-O-N-F, and um, uh, either Shannon or I will catch it and we'll ask it of our speakers. Okay. Okay. Is the microphone working? Can everyone hear me? Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to be presenting on um, research that's based on an operational project that's been going on for a while. I'm also using Prezi for the first time ever, so we'll see how this goes. So this is a mixed methods task analysis of the implementation and validation of EHR-based clinical quality measures. And briefly, who here is familiar with clinical quality measures, knows what they are? All right. This is a brief overview. The processes surrounding CQM clinical quality measure implementation and validation are complex, time-consuming, and largely undefined. So we collected issue tracking data that we used during the process of implementing and validating a set of quality measures. And I'm going to go into more detail on all of this. Um, and from that issue tracking data, we derived a, um, an, an implementation and validation process, and we identified major roadblocks and bottlenecks. So I'm going to give you an overview of that. And then I'm going to finish up by providing some recommendations for other people who are working in this or related areas. All right, so some background on clinical quality measures. The reason why we need them is because they are necessary for clinical quality improvement. You can't actually improve something unless you know how you're doing and you need to be able to measure that improvement if you are trying to, to change some of your processes. So CQMs can be used in the inpatient or outpatient ambulatory setting, and generally they are targeted at measuring clinical processes, clinical outcomes, or structures, so institutional structures um, mostly. And outcomes are difficult to measure. So a lot of the time we kind of take a step back and we measure clinical processes instead. So basically, are we delivering care the way that we want to, the way that we are expected to? And clinical quality measures are becoming more and more central in healthcare and in informatics. In 2009, with the introduction of ARA, which included the High Tech Act, um, something called Meaningful Use was, um, was put forward. And I'm guessing everyone's familiar with that. But basically, there's three stages of, of meaningful use. And it includes um, various requirements of EHRs in order to be certified and also uh, healthcare practitioners need to adopt EHRs that have these capabilities. And this also includes uh, promoting the use of electronic health records for quality improvement, including through quality, measures, uh, quality measure reporting. So this is really something that is actually codified in federal law at this point. And with each stage of meaningful use, there's more and more emphasis on it. Oh, one of my figures did not come through. That's cool. Um, okay. So this is an example of a clinical quality measure. This is a human-readable one. 
quality measures have numerators and denominators. And in this case, we are um, measuring the assessment of left ventricular, left ventricular ejection fraction or systolic heart function in patients with heart failure. So the denominator for this is all patients who are 18 and older and have a diagnosis of heart failure and also who have had a visit in the past year. It doesn't say that in this specification, but it's somewhere else in the technical details, which is one complication with these. And the numerator is that they need to have either a quantitative or qualitative assessment of this ventr uh, ventricular ejection fraction. So the figure that you can't see that's supposed to be right here is a really nice Venn diagram, some really nice colors. So even though this is presented as um, a numerator over a denominator, what you're actually looking at is the overlap between the denominator and numerator, the patients who are in both, and you divide that by the overall denominator population, and you get a percentage of patients that are meeting this quality measure. Um, part of the complication with this is generally when we're doing this with EHR data, we have limitations on the data that we can access. We also have limitations on the quality of the data. So there are problems with completeness, there are problems with correctness. Um, sometimes things are out of date. So even though an LVF may have been reviewed in the past year, it was actually entered two years ago, so we would miss that with an automated system. So there are all these true positives, but also unfortunately lots of false negatives, sometimes some false positives. So it's, what we are measuring is, we're trying to get as close as we can to the true performance, but it's difficult. And part of this is also because a lot of the data in the EHR is unstructured. Oh, hey. Doesn't that look nice? Hey. All right, so to, uh, to kind of explain the role of informatics in this, so for, for quality measures, there's usually some kind of benchmark. Ideally, you want to reach 100% performance. Um, and then underneath that, the dashed line, the black one, represents what the actual performance is. But we can't even accurately assess that a lot of the time. What we have is the observed results based on the data that we have access to. And with the power of informatics, we want to first get up to a point where we are observing the truth of the situation. And once we can accurately capture what's really going on in terms of performance, then we can work on improving performance itself. Does that make sense? Everyone knows what a CQM is now? Yes. OK, so what's the problem with this? Um, CQM calculation through manual chart review is incredibly time consuming. It's unsustainable if you want to have it going um, on longitudinally. So we need automated CQMs. There's been some movement towards what are called electronic or machine readable CQMs but they're not always available. The, the set that we worked with for this project are human readable. Um, and they're still subject to these same limitations stemming from data quality. And they're not immediately computable. You have to map them and you have to have some kind of institutional knowledge. So overall, there's no good roadmap for how we do this kind of implementation. And right now, the entire process requires a substantial amount of expertise and manual development. So what we need is a roadmap. How do we make this process more streamlined? How do we make sure that what we are doing is comparable to what other institutions are doing? Because that's part of the goal here, to know how we're performing compared to other people. So in this project, what we did was we empirically derived a process for CQM implementation and validation. We attempted to uncover common roadblocks and bottlenecks and address them. And we're going to propose some solutions. So briefly our methods and setting. This is a collaboration between the DMICE Informatics Discovery Lab and the Knight Cardiovascular Institute. We work with nine heart failure measures that are uh, set forth by the American College of Cardiology. And we use an existing system developed by David Doerr, um, the Integrated Care Coordination Information System, also known as ISIS. Um, these Briefly are the nine measures. So we looked at LVEF assessment in the inpatient and outpatient setting, symptom assessment, symptom management, patient education, um, the use of certain medication classes, beta blockers and ACEs and ARBs, and those are actually a, t uh, a paired set of measures. So we did the development together for both of them. Um, counseling regarding the implantation 
of a defibrillator device um, for patients who are not responding to medical therapy properly, and then the scheduling of a post-discharge appointment for patients in the inpatient setting. We realized during the course of this project that there was so much, there were so many moving pieces, so much con kind of cognitive um, overhead and overload that we needed some way to track what we were doing. So using um, the bridge site that is available through O2, uh, Deb Woodcock developed an issue tracking database. And we can do this for each of the measures or for all of the measures. Um, we create tasks, we assign tasks, we identify problems. Um, you can open and close a task, you can set priority. And we weren't perfect about tracking everything, but basically anything that was kind of an issue and couldn't be taken care of immediately ended up tracked here. And then we used a combination of qualitative and quantitative analysis. So even though these data were totally operational, um, we basically downloaded them and analyzed them. And the qualitative aspect of that included doing open coding on all of the tasks and actually generating categories of work involved in this process. And then three of us did consensus tagging and assigned each of the tasks to one of those groups. And then on the quantitative end, um, it was fairly straightforward. We calculated the duration of each task. And I want to emphasize that this is not how long it actually took to do the work because some of these tasks ran concurrently and also sometimes we would open a task and then realize that we had to do something else first. So this is just how long a task was open from beginning to end and we refer to that as task days. And then we did some um, basic temporal analyses and visualizations in order to understand what we were actually doing and what the process is like. So this is a brief summary of our overall findings. We identified seven categories of work around this process of implementation and validation. First is interpretation. So you get your specification, your human readable specification in this case. What does it actually mean? How do we map this um, from the concepts in the measure to the concepts that are actually available to us? How do we identify the population of interest? Then data exploration. So Maybe there's some piece of data that we're not aware of or that we haven't captured yet, and we need to go find it and bring it into our system so that we can use it for calculation. System development and debugging was work that was done on the back end, so largely on ISIS in terms of ETL of new data elements and basically creating the overall um, processing infrastructure. Next was the actual development and debugging of the measures themselves, which are all written in SQL. And then validation. So once we think the queries are working as well as they possibly can, we do a very in-depth manual chart review, gold standard based evaluation to see what are we missing? What are we capturing? Is there anything else we can fix? Or if we've fixed everything we can, what, are, what is still getting missed in this process? Then after that, we do synthesis and analysis. And that's a combination of kind of an error analysis. What are the most common sources of um, misses in these queries, what are our recommendations in terms of workflow or documentation changes, and also the development of um, a lot of really great visualizations that take the information from the CQMs and make them actionable for the providers and for KCVI more broadly. So that's the part where we're actually really trying to improve um, not just the calculation of the CQMs, but the actual clinical performance with that information. And lastly, informing and updating stakeholders. So the delivery of this information to the stakeholders in presentations or in meetings. And, whoops, nope. So these are some quick kind of summary statistics about the, um, the different categories of work. So this is um, the number, the absolute number of each task by measure. And again, six and seven are paired. Those are the medication measures. And these are the overall task days. And again, remember, some of those run concurrently. So you can see six and seven had a lot of tasks, and it also took a really long time. There is a lot of complexity there. And then you've got something like measure nine, which was the scheduling of follow-up appointments, where there are not nearly as many tasks, but it still took a lot of time. So there are certain tasks involved that were extremely time-consuming. So I'm going to dive into this data Oh, wait, no, first I'm going to do this. Um, 
So these are, again, the seven categories. And if you take kind of a naive approach, you might expect that this is a largely linear process, that you start with interpretation, you find the data that you need, you do a little bit of iteration around system development and measure development until you get it right, then you validate, you synthesize everything, you deliver your results, and everything's great. Is that actually what we find? So <laughs> these Gantt charts represent um, the longitudinal uh, work that we did. For, this isn't all of the measures, but it's kind of a, a subset of representative ones. Then at the bottom, we've got this category of all measures. This is not a combination of all of the tasks. These are tasks that were specifically assigned to all measures, so they were relevant for the entire project instead of a specific measure. And some of these are kind of um, linear, and they follow that process we expected, and some of them are really not. And I'm going to step through some examples. Um, so this one up here is the second measure. This is LVF assessment in the inpatient setting. This is a nice linear one. So at the top, we did some interpretation. At the same time, we were exploring the data that we needed. We were able to find it um, because we already had those LVF data. Uh, and then that dark green line of the various dark green lines is the system development, which took a while, but it went fairly according to plan. We had to develop some infrastructure to capture inpatient information, which is different in how it flows from the outpatient information. And then we kind of proceeded nicely through the measure development, the validation, and the analysis, and that was great. Then this was the first measure we did. This is LVEF in the outpatient setting. And this is the very first measure we worked on. And the big issue with this one was we had a tremendous amount of trouble identifying um, KCVI providers and patients. There was no real straightforward way to do this. Um, and the provider list changes constantly. So we had to develop mechanisms for capturing this, for incorporating it into our system. And then how do I identify patients based on that? Because often patients are identified based on their primary care provider for CQM calculation. And in this case, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to identify them based on if they had seen a KCVI provider and which one. So you can see that was kind of an ongoing problem over time. And we got all the way to the point of saying, hey, here are our results. And then we realized we had to go back and fix some stuff. Um, this is the combined medication measure for beta blockers and ACEs and ARBs. And what happened with this one was we were moving along. We got to the point of measure development. We even got to the point of validation. And we realized that we were missing some data elements. We had just been looking for medication data. And then we realized that there were smart data elements in EPIC and also some discharge orders where a provider could say, I prescribe this medication. Or they could say, this patient is not, should not be getting this medication. They should be excluded from this measure altogether. So we brought in those new ones. And then we had this incredibly complex logic that we had to implement in SQL. Um, which is basically saying, if they meet this criteria, but not this one, but what if they also meet this one? It took a while. So we started the validation, redid everything, and then we had to do the validation over again. And it was a complex validation because of all of those elements. This was measure nine, the one that I mentioned that had not that many tasks, but took a lot of time. And that's largely because we couldn't figure out where to find the post-discharge appointments, which seems like something that's fairly straightforward but that information lives in a special place in EPIC, and it was just very hard to track down from the front end to where it lived in the back end. And then overall, across all the measures, we just had lots and lots of system work. And this goes back to that issue of the provider list and attributing patients to the appropriate providers. Um, and again, a lot of the time that's done based on the PCP or the most recently seen provider. And what we realized is we wanted to do something called multiple attribution. So any provider who has seen a patient during the measurement period, this patient kind of goes on to their personal calculation of how they are performing according to these CQMs. And that involved just developing a bunch of new infrastructure. Everyone okay with that? That spin? Is that all right? So this is what our observed process. It's still kind of linear. But at every single point in the process, there is the possibility for iteration. When you're actually checking the work that has been done, is this capturing the reality of the situation? Can we fix this? 
So at any point, you might, you know, you can get all the way to validation and you say, hey, we're missing some data, and you go back up to data validation. So this can be very time consuming, but to some extent, it's unavoidable. So here's the summary of our issues. For one thing, our process is much more iterative than expected. Um, and this is actually a, um, a process for eCQM implementation proposed by uh, the American Hospital Association. And even though those are supposed to be machine readable, they identify a lot of the same problems in terms of data capture and workflow redesign, and is also very iterative. So it's interesting that we kind of, you know, I realize these diagrams look very different, but we arrived at kind of the same conclusion. There's also the fact that system development took a lot of time, even with a robust existing platform. So for people who don't have that CQM engine, they're starting even further back than we are. And lastly, this issue of data exploration sometimes caused really major derailments. So here are conclusions and recommendations. So one thing that we need to understand is the difference between what we know we don't know versus what we don't know we don't know. So with all of this iteration, some of it's unavoidable because you, there are things that you're going to discover along the way. You need to be prepared to discover them. And that's OK. It's important. But there are certain things that we're iterating on that we really should be able to front load into the process. Those are the things that we know we don't know. And if we know we don't know something, we should go and we should know it before we start moving forward. So we know that we need to find the data. So this is something we should front load as much as we can. We know we need to provide utility for the users. So this means we really need to understand user needs as much as possible at the start of the process. So this is like that issue of multiple attribution. That's something we should have figured out to begin with. And going forward, we will you know, try and front load that kind of work. But at the same time, we need to be open to, this, to the discovery of what we don't know. So unexpected problems and new sources of information. And that's unavoidable and it's important. And if we're not open to that, these measures are not going to work as well as they could. So this is where we are now. And we decided to take some of this work and actually um, make it actionable and useful for our group. And this is my last little bit. I realize I'm a bit over time. So these colors correspond to those seven categories of work, interpretation, data exploration, system development, query development, validation, synthesis, and analysis. Actually, those are six because I left off the, um, the reporting step because that comes at the end of all of this. And then we also have these different roles within our team. And that's one of our strengths, that we have this large collaborative team with different skill sets. So what we tried to do was outline this process in a somewhat linear way with the different responsibilities and breaking it down into the individual components. But what you'll see is there are checks at almost every single step of the way. So after someone dis um, develops the query logic and someone then starts implementing the query, there's a different person who actually debugs the query and makes sure it's doing what it's supposed to. Then someone checks the data that are coming out of the query to make sure that the data look the way they're supposed to. The validation similarly has a number of steps. And each of those checks is an opportunity to make sure we're doing things right and iterate if we need to. This has also made the team handoff a lot smoother. So when one person finish their, finishes their assignment, they know to create a task for the next person and hand it off to them. So the dependencies have been clarified. And I wouldn't say that our current work is going quickly, but it is going more smoothly. And we're doing a better job of front loading what we want to and limiting that iteration to the points that we really need to. So oh, I could have zoomed in more. That is where we are at this point. The end. So you have two questions from the Twitter room. Okay. And I'm going to read them to you and then maybe short answers only because I know we're strapped for time. But um, the first one is from Raja. It says, will machine readable CQMs help simplify the observed implementation process? And how do systems like ICCIS adapt to XML CQMs? I think those are too long to answer short. We can, I can have you craft <laughs> a reply on the Twitter sphere. No, I can give a somewhat quick answer. I think it will help. But um, prior research indicates that the machine-readable eCQMs do not totally negate this problem. They still run into a, a lot of the same issues with mapping um, and needing to iterate. And these things, they're not plug and play. The hope is that they would be, but they're not. 
Oh, the XML? Yeah, with uh, ICCIS. Oh, with ISIS. Um, I mean, it, again, it means that things will be somewhat more streamlined in terms of implementation, but there is still going to be a certain degree where, of mapping going from the XML to what's actually in the system. Um, with the adoption of standards, that really gets a lot better, but there's always going to be at least some that you need to do. Actually, the other question is from Kate Boltalis that I'm sure you can't answer in 30 seconds, but um, CQM is based on what gold standard? What are the gold standards for clinical quality measures? You could probably talk for 30 minutes on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually, this is kind of an interesting point without diving too much into it. The real gold standard CQMs that are um, codified in meaningful use standards are maintained by um, CMS, um, and there's also the National Quality Foundation that has these like really formalized um, specifications for different measures. So these are actually from the ACC and there's a lot of alignment between these and some of the measures that are maintained by the NQF. These were used to create some of the NQF measures, but there are certain differences and KCVI felt very strongly that these ACC measures um, did a better job of capturing what was meaningful for them in terms of their care processes. But ultimately, they should be based on some kind of evidence. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, they are evidence-based. And if you read through any CQM specification, sorry, wrong understanding of gold standard on that. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of information about why, um, why they're measuring what they are. The measurements are supposed to align to clinical, specific clinical practices that are recommended, specific clinical guidelines. to close the gap using documentation templates uh, to get the data up in the front end? Um, that's actually a really great question. So one of our partners in this project um, is an EPIC analyst uh, named Anandita Bagchi who is, uh, has already actually developed and um, started piloting a template to capture this information in a way that is going to feed more directly into the measures, but also, and this is really important, is making the information more actionable for the providers. Because if we just ask providers to document more and to document in a more structured way, it's not useful for them. So the real trick is to say, not just um, how do we capture this information, but how do we help the providers actually take care of their patients better using these data? So that is going on. That's pretty cool. Um, okay, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Gorman, um, who uh, has been in this department a long time, along with myself and some others. And so, um, however, he is going to talk about something new, something that he and I have, have been um, wandering the desert for, it seems like, 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've just recently been let into the promised land, <laughs> and uh, I will let him tell the story. All right. Is this on? Yeah. Actually, Bill, you would have made this slide in 1992 if you could have. Because <laughs> I think he got on the curriculum committee in, in about 92 or something because he wanted to get informatics into the curriculum. And it, it takes a while, but we're starting to get there. So I want to talk about a new role that I've been uh, busying myself with recently. Um, which has to do with getting clinical informatics into the medical school curriculum. Um, first of all, who am I and what do I do? Some of you know me, some of you don't, and I might be different from what you knew before. So the main thing I spend my time on right now is I'm a thread director in the MD curriculum, which I'll, I'll explain that figure in a minute. The second main thing I do nowadays is I'm the assistant dean for rural medical education. So I get to go drive around the state and try to make better rural medical education. The third thing that I do is I'm a coach for MD students. So we have this coaching program to try and help our, our medical students uh, be their best. Uh, and the fourth thing I try to do is uh, be a medical informatics faculty 
That's not a picture of our faculty. That's actually a picture of the uh, study section at the National Library of Medicine, busy thinking about informatics, as they do. So who are you? How many in this room are health professionals of one sort or another? Nurse, doctor, respiratory therapist, OK. How many in this room are computer scientists or engineers, primarily? And these aren't mutually exclusive categories, of course. Um, are there any library or information scientists in the room? OK. Uh, social scientists, anthropology, sociology, social work, psychology, and, and a paucity of social science. Any basic scientists? Anybody work at the bench? And is there anyone in the room that's a management or organizational scientist? OK. Um, I had a nice figure from Yuck and Moore, University of Victoria, that kind of says those are all informatics. He had a nice way of depicting it. But so that's, that's who you all are. Some of you have been to medical school. Some of you have not. So we'll talk a little bit about med MD curriculum. But first, I want to ask you if you had a pen and paper with you, um, if we still use those artifacts. What do you want your doctor to know about informatics? You go in the office, you do your waiting, you get in there, you sit down in the exam room, in comes your doctor. What's the one thing you want to be sure she knows about informatics? Anybody? Justin? How to get the information they need to treat your problem. Homer. How to use the electronic health record optimally. How to use the EMR optimally. That's a tricky word. Gretchen. How to get the latest, greatest, and most up-to-date information about my issue. Not only late, not only great, but up-to-date. Anybody else? Is that it? Is that a curriculum? They want to understand, you want them to understand what clinical informatics is. OK. Is that it? That's a, that's a, a beginning agenda, Dion. I want them to know I'm more than my electronic medical records chart. So you want to, them to, to know you're more than just an EMR template. So here's uh, some things doctors do. They build rapport with people. They use up almost every instant of spare time doing something, and these two doctors are doing something while this one's, I don't know what they're doing, checking the stocks, but doing some work all the time, and very often interacting with technology, a lot of it. They engage and educate their patients about their disorders. They work in multidisciplinary teams using technology. That looks like a teleconsult. They use diagnostic technology of every description. They try to make medicine and healthcare be human. And they collaborate. That's a surgeon, family doctor, and a patient. Looks like a good outcome has either happened or is expected. So how can we, what do we want those people to know so they can take better care of us? Well, you gave us some answers. And um, Bill Hirsch and some others on our faculty tried to answer this question and came up with uh, some competencies for clinical informatics and medical education, which were published two years ago. And these are the competencies that they came up with. Find, search, and apply knowledge-based information to patient care. That sounds like I was indeed. <laughs> Gretchen, uh, effectively read and write from the EHR. So some of the things you talked about. But some others, engage in quality measurement, selection, and improvement that we just heard about. Apply personalized and precision medicine. So they can figure out if you've got a gene that makes you metabolize that drug differently. So they'll prescribe a different drug or prescribe it better. So this is a pretty good list. And I'm not going to go into all of it. Um, we'll be glad to send you a copy of the paper. But it's a bunch of stuff. And that's categories. There's actually a bunch of competencies for each of those. But there's a problem. This is Mark Goslin's analogy. The medical curriculum is like penguins on an ice floe. You can only fit so many. And once that ice flow is crowded, each new penguin that gets on pushes somebody off into the water where the orcas are waiting. <laughs> now, some of the things we do in medicine try to get the penguins to hold hands so that they won't fall off. That is to say, make cognitive structures that make things stick together. But the truth is, 
you can't teach more stuff. MD students, we can march down to the CLSB and find some. If we ask them, is there any room in the cranium for more stuff, they'll tell you, not a bit. Which brings us to the next question. What should we stop teaching your doctor? What are the things your doctor knows that you would like her not to know anymore so they can have room for this informatics stuff? You've got something? Krebs Jim, cycle. Krebs cycle. <laughs> One of my favorite things in biochemistry. I love Krebs cycle. Actually, I want my doctor to have the enough knowledge of the Krebs cycle so if she truly needed to know about it, she could go relearn look it. it, relearn it, look it up quickly. It's funny that you bring up Krebs cycle because they changed the name of the serum glutamic acid oxalic acid transaminase test, SGOT, to the aspartate transaminase test, AST. And for me to remember whether it, what is AST and what's ALT, it's actually the Krebs cycle that helps me remember, oh, that's right, oxalic. Anyway, it doesn't matter, <laughs> but it helps me remember. So is there anything else you don't want your doctor to know? Because, for example, should we teach them less anatomy? Should we teach them less? Which, which anatomy do they not need? Trick question. The exact insertion points of every muscle and every bone. So they don't need to know the insertion of every muscle and every bone for the average physician. Ah, OK. Um, cell biology. Statistics, preventive medicine, how to interview and talk to people, nutrition. I'm sure, that I'm confident, I'm 100% certain that I can, within a mile's walk, find someone who would tell you that we're not teaching enough about each of these, whether it's the Krebs cycle, nutrition, genetics, communicating with people, ethics, professionalism. So we got this zero-sum game problem. <laughs> and it's not, not a trivial problem. And we've dealt with it for years. And now we got more stuff to put in there. So the 20th century version of what doctors should learn was there's these two big buckets. There's the basic science bucket. And a lot of us in the old curricula spend a year learning this stuff. And then there's the clinical science bucket. And a lot of us spent the subsequent years learning this stuff. How to interview people and communicate with them, examine them, reason, and so forth. And now we're in a different century. And there's a third big bucket. And it, we call it, it's starting to be called health system sciences. And it contains things like, there it is, Bill, <laughs> medical informatics, epidemiology, health systems, quality, safety, those kinds of things. And we're really in a new world where of all the stuff you used to have to learn, and Tim's right, there's, you got to jettison something. Uh, because there has to be room for these new things. It's a different world. Physicians, for example, need to understand in a much deeper way than they ever have all of the stuff that Nicole just talked about. Um, what we're measuring, how we're measuring it, why we're measuring it, what those measurements mean. So here's what we've been testing. I looked at the United States Medical uh, Licensing Exam study book that students use. When they cram for the step one board exam, this is the book. And I, I just kind of estimated the number of pages for topics. You can see there's about. 36 pages of heart and 50 pages of neurology. There's six pages of statistics and epi. There's not a word about safety and quality. And there's no informatics in there. Yes? I'm going to show you that. It does. Um, so for those that uh, are, are on distance learning and can't hear, someone said they still have nightmares from step one. Um, so here's the newest version. So the way they get this is they talk to students who took the exam and say, what were the questions about? And they build this study guide that's based on the past test, not the future test. So the book the students will buy this year has 44 pages of cardiovascular and 38 of heme and 32 of renal, nine pages of epi and stats, a new thing, page and a half of safety and quality. So there's a new, some new stuff fitting in there. 
if you look at the National Board of Medical Examiners content outline for what they're building tests of now, this is the number of lines in the outline devoted to each topic. It's kind of interesting to see that biostats, epi, and the literature, 6% are as big as cardiology and renal. I think you'll be happy. Systems, safety, and quality have more lines of content in that outline than the heart and the kidney. Uh, this, is a, this is a sea change. This is huge. And that's the testing outline. What they're planning to test on in the future, if you look at the list of things that they think should be incorporated, clinical informatics, healthcare delivery systems, economics, policy, teamwork, leadership and change agency, stuff that was nowhere near a medical school classroom before, and now it's a big part of our content. So we're going to have to forget the Krebs cycle, or at least most of it. So at the School of Medicine here, we, what time is it? Thank you. Um, we revised our curriculum, built a new building, built a new curriculum to try and accommodate this sort of how do we train the doctor of the future who should not only be uh, skillful at assessing and improving their own skills, but also able to adapt to new discoveries and new technology and lead a culture of change that creates a continuously improving health system. That's what we're all hoping for. We need to start training physicians for that. This is a nice schematic of our new curriculum. Let me walk you through it. In the preclinical years, which start about here, we have seven blocks of integrated clinical science that are kind of organ system based. They integrate basic and clinical together, ideally. Then, in the clinical year, we, by the way, that's only 18 months, so it went from 24 months to 18. Then, during the clinical years, there are seven core clinical experiences that students do, working, doing actual direct patient care with guidance. Um, and during that core clinical time, we actually bring the students back for what are called intersessions, two-week periods where they come back from the wards and they revisit basic science and they revisit health system science and get some concentrated deep dives into things. Is that genetic stuff I learned about? Oh, yeah, it's relevant. I'm going to go relearn it now. Um, and this is all very flexible and individualized, so it's much more flexible than ever before. And then, to make sure that certain things get covered, like anatomy, you'd like to be sure there's enough anatomy in there, that's a thread, this yellow one, that is intended to be woven through the curriculum, through all parts of it. And so we have these big blocks, and then we have threads of anatomy and pharmacology and so forth, and the health system sciences and informatics are some of those threads. And those are the threads that I'm responsible for squeezing into the curriculum and trying to produce continuity. So that's our new curriculum. As we were developing an informatics curriculum, we used the competencies that Bill published about that the group of faculty here developed and said, by the end of that preclinical time, the day the students step out onto the wards to start doing practical work, what competencies, what should they possess? And we thought they ought to be able to do what Gretchen said and access the latest knowledge they can learn. They ought to be good at protecting pa patient health information. They ought to be able to access and use the EHR in a rudimentary way, as Homer said. And we also said they ought to be able to engage the patients with the health uh, information technology, not um, distance the patients with the technology. And it can be either way. I don't know if you've been with a doctor where they were paying more attention to the computer than you. Um, that's a very, and you can use it effectively. We want them to learn that. And then by graduation, we want to be competent users of health IT and data, not only to improve patients, but also populations and systems. So those are our milestones. This is too small to read, but it's this, the big picture of how we envision threading this stuff. On the left, in this column are the categories of our competencies, like access medical knowledge and use decision support and um, uh, provide clinical data care with telemedicine. And across the columns at the top are the major blocks of curriculum, preclinical, milestone, and then the clinical years. 
And one of the things we reasoned was that some parts of the curriculum, some of our goals and objectives would be better met in the preclinical classroom phase, but other things we thought would be better learned later in the clinical phase. Quality improvement, for example. You kind of need some clinical experience to even know what they're talking about when they say, let's make sure the left ventricular ejection fraction is documented in every progress note. And so students can understand why it might or might not be there. So we came up with this big framework and started to develop specific goals for each, for how to integrate these concepts into the curriculum. A couple of strategies. The challenge is how to fit this stuff in there. Um, one of our strategies was to try and tailor the content to the weekly curriculum content. So if this week they're learning about um, kidneys and the nephron, we'll try to find a way to make our informatics content match or complement or help them learn that so that the informatics seems to be a part of it. The second thing we, we did was we, tried, we made a lot of what we called clinical pearls. So in medicine, teaching medicine, there's this pearl of wisdom that traditionally, you know, you would learn from the masters, this little clinical pearl, a little nugget of valuable information. So we thought, let's make some informatics pearls, and each week we'll give them five minutes, ten minutes of some trick or, 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 or useful way to use the EHR or the technology. We call those clinical informatics pearls, and we meant for them to help them get the information they needed to study that week. So if this week they're going to talk about anemia, then we wanted to show them in the EHR how to get to look at the uh, blood counts and see them and see them arrayed in a graph, for example. Um, and the idea there was to build skills in small, relevant increments. Um, the third strategy was what Howard Silverman from Arizona told me to try, which is um, cotton ball in a water glass. The idea here is if you have a glass of water, um, it holds a certain amount of water. If you put a cotton ball in there first, you can put almost the same amount of water, <laughs> but now the cotton ball is there. So how do we get the, the informatics integrated so completely that no one notices that we displaced some of the water? And that's deeply embedded in the clinical content. We also had traditional didactic sessions. Um, we have skills labs and some uh, assessments and some supplemental enrichment week sessions for part of the class. <laughs> Here's an example of a pearl. In this particular week, the, patient, the students are presented with the case of a patient. And um, Dr. Goslin, the director of the foundation's curriculum, gives them a little intro to it. And with that, there's a clinical informatics pearl that says, uh, if you want to read about, if you want to learn a particular thing or do a particular task, here we have one of our faculty with a little short video saying, here's how you do this. Here's how I do this. Uh, to give them little tips. So that was the idea behind the pearls. Um, it's sideways. I've had almost everything go wrong in a presentation. I had a better one than you. I had a, a graphic that didn't show up that was the whole slide. This was in London at MedInfo. And the only thing on the slide was P less than 0.05. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing else there. So I don't know what it was, but it was significant. Anyway, in this particular case, that says serologic tests in rheumatology. So Leslie Kale wanted to teach the students how to use uh, blood tests for things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And I wanted to teach them Bayes' theorem and receiver operating characteristics. And I'm pretty sure no one will show up or stay awake if they're at a lecture on Bayes' theorem and receiver operating characteristics. So instead, the two of us co-taught a session where she was able to make the point she wanted about DNA, and I was able to slip in a little positive predictive value stuff. And that's the sort of cotton ball in the glass method, which takes a lot of time and work to make it happen. Status report. Some things are working, some things are not. Um, if you live in Portland and you've been driving across the, one of the other bridges, you notice somewhere near here this thing sticking up in the middle of a river. And it wasn't clear what that thing was. But a few months later, there was another thing sticking up in the middle of the river <laughs> that looked kind of similar. And over time, it became evident that they were building a bridge. And now we have this gorgeous um, Tillicum Bridge down there. 
And that's how we're building the informatics curriculum. We're putting pieces in one at a time. We're probably about there. <laughs> Maybe we're there. But it's a, pro it's, a, it's a work in progress. Challenges. Number one, the variable background of students. Using Instagram is not computer savvy. So we had sessions. We did a session to look at quality data. And we had them all open this stuff up in an Excel spreadsheet. And a lot of people have never put a, a formula into an Excel spreadsheet. So some of the things we assumed they would be able to do, they had no idea. Um, second, um, students are deer in the headlights of step one. So step one is the board exam they have to take. It is perceived to be, and it's a real perception, the determinant of one's future. You literally toss out whole possibilities for careers based on that score. So they're very focused on step one. And if it's not on step one, then why are you talking to me about it, <laughs> is the way they're, they think. And it's realistic for them to think that way. So if informatics isn't on step one, then why are we teaching it? What they don't know is it's going to be on step one. <laughs> it just hasn't been in the past. Third, it, isn't, it doesn't seem to many that these health system sciences are relevant. I think for students, they're getting stories from their second years and third years and fourth years and residents who tell them, oh, you don't need to know that stuff. I never learned that stuff. And their faculty tell them the same thing. I trained in the 70s. They didn't teach me that stuff. Um, and their, maybe their vision of what a doctor is doesn't include looking at population data or quality improvement pro projects. And also, I think we have some backward-facing faculty. It's very hard, and I'm one of them. You know, I've spent years developing this wonderful lecture that I do. And now they tell me, well, no, we've got to get rid of that and do this other stuff. And, and it's, a, it's a very difficult change process. There's the bricks or mortar um, argument for difficulty. Um, Anatomy is a block of curriculum. You can recognize it. We're taking an anatomy course now. There's a textbook. Stethoscope isn't. There's no stethoscope class. There's no stethoscope block. But we teach stethoscope everywhere. And so the question, a question arises, should you have a block of stuff, or should you try to insert stuff everywhere so it's almost people don't even know they're learning it? Um, there's a lot of technical issues. We've uh, we have a master, she's sitting right over here, at helping us use EPIC to teach students how to use EPIC, but there's a lot of limitations. Because for, for I think, I don't know if there's any EMR that was built with a student in the workflow model. And so getting, stu getting the EMR to accommodate students is a challenge. And then there's very few faculty who have the breadth and the depth and the time <laughs> to teach this stuff. So often, we have to rely on faculty who may not be as familiar with the concepts to teach the stuff that we need to teach. Those are some of the challenges. And I bet I'm out of time. Questions, thoughts, comments? Do we have time for questions? Yeah, you talk fast. Cool. I talk fast. How is this translated into their residency going forward uh, beyond the four years of medical school and thinking about information and yeah. information How is it technology? translated into residency? Well, they'll almost certainly do their residency somewhere else. Um, and there's good news and there's bad news. I think for me, the goal, the whole, I mean, the, the ideal is our students are more attractive to residencies because we train them better. And so if we've done a good job, then residents would say, yes, send those students because one of the things we're hearing from residencies, everyone's hearing from residencies, is the students are not ready. They're showing up, and different residencies are developing boot camps now because students show up and don't know how to, for example, write orders with the computer. And part of that is because they're not allowed to write orders with the computer, and so they don't learn it. So one of our goals is to get them more residency ready. On the other hand, it's almost certain that they'll face different technologies and different workflows when they get there. So some of what we learn, what we want to teach them, I don't know will transmit. I'll just add an adjunct to that, that the residency training here at OHSU has shifted to where they receive a basic four to eight hour EPIC instruction on our EPIC, but then they have an optional second session that is led by the chief residents in certain departments, and it's tailored specifically 
to what they need to know in our each EHR to hit the ground running. One of our master's students a few years ago uh, made the notice that surgery residents were learning to use five different EMRs because they were rotating to, rotating to five different places. And she was struck by the fact that every place had completely different requirements about how much training they needed from like two weeks to two minutes. And so this sort of how are they learning this stuff was a real interesting question to her in her thesis. Yeah. In some residency programs, um, including the OHSU Family Medicine Residency, they've decided that it actually can't be a zero-sum game, and they've added an extra year, and they've made it from a three-year residency to a fourth-year mandatory residency. The fourth year includes um, health science, uh, health services science, informatics, population health, quality improvement, patient safety curriculum, and project work. Yeah. Can you give me a rough idea, of just really ballpark, how much time is it taking to implement the medical informatics thread relative to how far you've gotten in it? I like couldn't tell you. I have no idea. I think that to, to be, uh, what I can tell you that's useful is um, a mistake I made was trying to integrate too much. And it's actually, uh, Howard Silverman told me this, I don't know why I didn't listen to him, but, but try, I had this vision of integration, which is going to be so seamless and wonderful and connected and relevant. But um, uh, A, that makes it disconnected from the point of view informatics. So as I rethink it, it's better to, to plan a coherent structure, first this, then this, then this, and make it more evident to the students that that's what they're learning. Um, and sacrifice a little bit of the integration. The other thing is the integration is wonderful when it happens, but it's really hard. You know, most faculty, the person talking at 9 has not seen the slides of the person talking at 10. Uh, and so it's, it's very, very difficult to get everybody to meet and then come up with good stuff. When they do, they come up with great stuff. Like uh, one of my favorites is uh, Outbreak. So uh, the next block is GI. Um, they're going to get a couple of pearls that teach them how to order a, a, a test, like a stool culture, and how to check on a test. They're going to get uh, a little bit of epidemiology about outbreak investigation, and they're not going to know why. And then they're going to get presented with a person who has diarrhea, and they're going to be told to order a culture. And a couple days later, they're going to be told to check their cultures. And, and they're going to have all different patients, but all the patients they have are going to have an E. coli infection. Uh, which creates an outbreak investigation. So one of the things where we kind of, a bunch of us got together and we figured out how could we make the epi pieces and the informatics pieces and the GI pieces and the infection control pieces fit together. And then that outbreak investigation talks about systems-based approaches to controlling infection in hospitals. So that, it's golden when it happens, but it's a lot of work. Okay. The first one is from Damien. It says, what are the top five informatics topics that were added to the curriculum? This is from... D Damien Barbola. Damien Barboja. Who, who should be listening in from Salt Lake City. <laughs> Damien Barboja from Argentina and now from Salt Lake. So the top five that were added, I would say um, uh, information literacy, accessing, acquiring, appraising information. Uh, that's number one. Number two, oh, there's a lot of EHR content, but it's spread out so that they don't know they're getting it. Um, Number three would actually be a precision medicine. There's some really good sessions on precision medicine and genetics. Uh, number four would be quality improvement. Um, and I don't know what number five is. Yes? Yeah. What are the, well, so that gets into the difference between training and education. There are two parts of the two two parts to my answer to that question. What the question for those that in distance uh, streaming are was uh, what are the chances that by the time current students graduate, there'll be some new technology that they have to learn? And the answer is twofold. One is that's why we need to educate, not train. Which is to say, training them to use Epic is a dead end. Teaching them, educating them about using EHRs, and trying to find those abstract translatable skills is a much more useful thing, and I think that's what we're trying to do. It's part two of that is, though, is what are the chances there will be a new technology? You know, if you'd asked me that the day before the web, 
I just said, ah, things will be the same. Don't think, don't worry about it. So there's, there's one, one more Twitter question. Actually, there's some. Um, yeah, uh, from uh, Kristen Stevens, one of our MD-PhD students. Uh, has there been success with team talk clinician plus subject area expert lectures? Has there been success with team talk? With team talk clinician plus subject area expert lectures. I think she was Oh, yeah, about team, taught, team taught clinician plus subject area. So Leslie Kale and I doing rheumatology. There's another good one, um, Dennis Koop, uh, pharmaco, uh, pharmacology and physiology. Uh, was teaching a session on pharmacogenomics uh, and sort of differences in uh, genetic differences in metabolism of drugs. And he divided the students into groups, each of whom would, worked on a different class of drugs. And I was in the room to add some, kind of the clinical content. So I think it's, it's very possible. And, and when it happens, it can be very successful. Um, but I think every kind of multidisciplinary work takes a lot of work just to know what the other guy's talking about. Um, uh, I was working on a team on a research project, and we had a word. We, the computer scientists and I were using a particular word, and it took us a year to discover we meant something different by that word. Uh, and I think that's a challenge. It's, it takes a while to get to where we're on the same page, but it definitely works. Okay, let's take maybe one more yeah. Yes, sir. It's not so much the technology as understanding the systems of healthcare as we move into the future, because that's what's rapidly changing. When you get talk about population health, quality, and safety, and now value-based uh, uh, yeah. income. So a physician's now, if we go into 2020, will not be paid on a fee-for-service. They're going to be paid on quality outcomes and how good they are protecting the patient's safety, improving the quality. Mm -hmm. Readmission rates, we're already penalized for readmission rates if they're higher than a certain percent of less than 30 right. days, all these type of things. And that's, that's more system-based. So we're in ACOs, CCOs, with all right. population base, right. and that's where things are going. And so technology in informatics is going to help with that. But the training has to be in that area of systems, I think. Yep, absolutely. Systems. Uh, oh, is that we, we're good? I, yeah, I we're all right. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been fun. What are the chances we'll all be carrying a device that we can't live without and look at a thousand times a day? We should change the name to Oregon Health and Systems University. Really? Health and Systems? Oregon Health and Systems University. What if someone Good luck with that. you when you were in medical school that someday you'd be carrying around a device that gives you access to all the world's knowledge and you would use it to look at pictures of cats and argue <laughs> with strangers you don't know? <laughs>